reach agreement on do not track. So instead of trying to hide where you've gone, we're going to click every single ad on your page. And so this is an effort to use obfuscation in, in, that, in that way. All right, done. Thank you. My name is uh, Stefan Schmoll from uh, DevRiWare, and I have a question, two, que two questions for you, Helen. Uh, if I got you well, you have, uh, amongst others, clearly explained that uh, privacy is, uh, and its possible disruptions, are uh, widely depending on the context and uh, involve the parties and including some social uh, parameters and also some uh, sociological parameters. Uh, my question is the following. To what extent do you believe that the law, the law could or should uh, rule privacy protection? That's yeah. my first question. And yeah. the second is uh, how far do you think that uh, education could or should do the job? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to make the obvious answer, which I think both. No, but I'll tell you, I th the law, the law has a really important role to play. And I know there's a big debate between the US and Europe about how to do it. I like this, but one aspect of the US law that I like is the fact that it, it, it's sectoral. And so there has been an effort to develop privacy rules that apply in education, in the financial, and so forth. Unfortunately, they haven't done a very good job. And when we look at FERPA, which is <coughs> the, the education, it's ancient and it can't handle most of the challenge that, that we confront today. So I, th I would like to see the law um, focusing on context, you know, in, in, in developing rules that limit what various parties can do in these various contexts. Now, sometimes you, you don't necessarily want to have a law that goes all the way down to detail because it's, you know, for all the reasons that, that they say. So, um, you may need to do it at a fairly high degree of generality and then let, you know, then let um, professional societies and, and, you know, the NGOs and do the rest. And education is, is important, but I, I'm less optimistic about what we can do with that, just from my experience. I'm just being brief in my answers because there's a lot more to say, yeah. Uh, hello, I'm Antonio Casilli, and uh, uh, my question, if I got uh, what you said right, and if I wrote it down right uh, in my live tweeting, you said that information does not belong to you, yeah. and you also said this is something that does not ensue, doesn't follow from contextual integrity, this is something you were saying like your stance, right? Now, uh, the question is, I, we've been reading, like many other, me and others, uh, what, for instance, uh, Jaron Lanier has been saying in his book, uh, um, uh, to, whom, uh, uh, to Whom Belongs the Future, I, I think that I got the title wrong, but anyway, um, he says basically that uh, given the fact that civil uh, rights uh, were not efficient in protecting our privacy, <coughs> what about uh, using uh, commercial rights yeah. and basically uh, monetizing privacy and uh, negotiating it between the users and uh, the, the, the owners of uh, the social network, social mm. media and so on. Mm. So I would like to say what's yeah. your take on that? Yeah, okay, I'm going to be very extreme here. I think it's a terrible idea. So <laughs> I know you were just talking about Jaron Lanier, but um, I'll just give you, first of all, I want people, when they say that, like sell your privacy, let's have a marketplace for privacy, that's already a mistake. What they should say is marketplace in information about people, which let's call it personal information. That's number one. Number two, the idea that ownership, 
I mean, there's so many reasons, but here's the second reason I'm going to stop there. If we talk about ownership and, and commercializing and marketplace exchanges and so forth, even when we look at our neighboring concept of ownership, we know that there's certain limitations on ownership rights. You know, if you own a piece of land and they discover, uh, you know, mineral, valuable minerals, then actually they don't belong to you. And then if someone wants to walk through your land, blah, 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 you don't have all these rights. And we, we develop these qualifications based on some kind of social utility. And so the, the problem here is that even intellectual property is not an in absolute right. There are always going to be these qualifications. And so by what the attempt is to say, look, maybe we understand intellectual, or sorry, property better than we understand privacy. Let's use this model to understand privacy. My pushback is we're, not, we're still going to hit those roadblocks even if we employ the property regime maybe you're going to get like the hardcore commercial entities to travel along part of the way but as soon as as soon as they don't like what you say they're going to create an exception so i just don't think we're going to get anywhere with that hello alan hornstein from from here at the telecom by tech one comment and one question. The comment deals with uh, your remark on court records. Mm -hmm. I suspect the Spanish reaction would be very much what you would find in France, okay. and in part because uh, it would print this publication, and the ease of publication could uh, bias any future uh, appeals procedures or things like that and there might be a question of saying well if it's court records from such and such a period it could be on online uh, in that respect my question deals with uh, the uh, the question of social integrity mm -hmm. and this project that the Icelandic mm -hmm. government started up the Estonians apparently followed through and then Tonga did of a, a national genetic database which they started in 1999. Since the population of Iceland is very homogeneous, they decided that they would get blood samples from each of the 275,000 people and uh, uh, create a huge genetic data bank uh, which could be used for current research and future research. At one point, and this was probably the slippery part of it, they decided that they would uh, sell some of the data mm. to big pharmaceutical companies uh, who agreed to uh, release free information about wonderful new cures yeah. to people who were in the database. The only way you could avoid this was opting out in which case the data would be there still, yeah. but it would be hidden yeah. very much as uh, with the, the picture that you showed before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but even then, you can say from po uh, your point of view of social integrity, mm -hmm. the, can they really opt out, not accept the cure which is going to save their lives, save the Icelandic gov government? much money in taking care of them. Uh, the, the question is not as easy as that, and apparently in Icelandic courts, it's, they're, they're going back over the whole question. Yes. Well, thank you. I mean, first of all, about the court records, I I, that, that particular reason you offer is really an interesting one. I think the Spanish have this idea of rehabilitation, and they feel that if this record is out there, it's going to make it much more difficult for people to be rehabilitated. But what you're saying about appeals and so on is also really interesting in, in, in thought, if I see it in terms of contextual integrity, because you might say one of the values of the court system is fairness. And if you can show that a practice of information flow is going to limit the achievement, the attainment of fairness in a court system, then this is problematic and maybe you want to avoid that. So, I mean, it's, it's, 
But in terms of decode, you know, the first of all, I, I remember saying something about this at a talk I gave, and someone came up to me afterwards from Iceland and said, you've got it all wrong, and so now I'm a little bit nervous to talk about it. But at the time I said, you know, I can understand why people in Iceland wouldn't mind that, because they have, they have a public health system. In the US, it's terrifying because you can lose your health insurance on, on the basis of pre-existing. And that's why I think things can differ from state to state because the consequences of this information flow. Then someone came up to me and said, oh, many people in Iceland think this is a terrible idea despite the fact, blah, blah, blah. So um, I, d I don't want to... Again, I'm not going to say, oh, genetic information is, is so personal, it's not up for grabs, but I'm going to encourage us to think through the flow of this genetic information according to all the parameters so that we can come up with certain rules that, you know, do what they're supposed to do. Anyway, thank you for your comment. Thank you very much, Helen. Maybe we have uh, another another series of questions after the, the talk of uh, Brigham Dalgish. So we're going to listen to Brigham now. Okay, so um, 